Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I think somebody else was saying the other day that people touch you more when you were on a sitcom because they think they, they, think they can, they, that they should, that you're their buddy. The number of people that grab me say, my mom loves you, and I'm like, it's great, but you know, can, can you let go? <laughs> everybody knows everybody from Canada is nice. We are nice. To your face. <laughs> but I, when I thought back and realized my dreams as a 10-year-old were that I wanted to star on Get Smart. I want. I watched Mash and All of the Family with my dad, and I, I wanted that. When I realized that was a job that you could have. Every once in a while, a show comes along that not only entertains but also opens viewer minds to a world that they knew nothing about and maybe were a little afraid of. Starting in the late 1990s and again recently. One of the funniest shows on TV went a long way in easing some preconceived notions about how some people in our world live their lives. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me today with actor Eric McCormick of Will & Grace. Hi, Eric. Steve Kometko. How you doing? Oh, man, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. How's life? Life is is uh, is great and varied at, at the moment, which is which is nice. I have to say, I have to lead with this that you, I, uh, and we'll talk about it. I'm sure that um, Sean Hayes and I are doing a, a podcast about our days on Will and Grace, and so we uh, tackle a new episode every episode. And last week we did an episode that had a Steve Kometko joke. Oh, good. Do you remember it? Yes, I do. <laughs> I remember it. I recorded it. It was Sean going to some big audition, which turned out to be an audition for, like, nothing, for some corporate film. But he, uh, he, was, he, just, he was assured that E was going to be there. And he said, maybe I'll get to meet, maybe I'll get to commit Steve Kometko. Yes, I remember that. I had friends from the East Coast calling, from the Midwest. you got to watch, because, you know, here in California, yeah. everything's two hours later. That's right. So... Yeah, I recorded it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's on my reel. Uh, tell me, when you reflect back on Will and Grace, uh, what are your fondest memories? Wow. You know, there's so many special things about it just as a show in itself, but I, one of my fondest memories is how life was, that, that um, we've always lived in the neighborhood. And uh, my son was born here at, during the show. And because Jimmy Burroughs directed every episode and he doesn't like to work past 2 p.m., our days were so short so that the, I, the memories of getting up on, say, a, a Wednesday morning and there was a new script in the mail that had been dropped off and sort of having coffee with that. We didn't have to be at work till 10, uh, playing with my kid or whatever, reading the new script, going in, having nothing but laughs. I mean, just so much fun and... and spoiled by the hours and then going home and having having a life uh there was something so we were so lucky to have that because so many people their hit show that made them like i don't know x files or something you're in you're in the woods for 14 hours every night in the freezing cold this was just a, such a beautiful experience and um and of course a lot of friends for life do you miss it yes i do uh it's so funny to, to meet people these days, particularly young people that are discovering the show or whatever. But it's always news to them somehow that we had real live audiences and, and um, that that's what we look forward to every week was Tuesday night. And uh, I miss that. I miss the buildup on the Monday. We'd been rehearsing for a few days and we'd present the show to the crew and they're hearing new jokes and they're laughing. And then Tuesday night was... It was magic. I really miss that because as, as a guy that, that came from the theater, it was the perfect thing. It was like, I have a TV show, but I still get to do a little play every week. You, uh, you just did some theater in New York, didn't you? Yeah. It was heaven um, because that's where I got my, my start. But I, I got my start in Canadian theater. Um, and I, you know, I didn't play Hamlet. I, was, I got my start in small productions, sometimes in small roles. Um, but it was, that was the first 10 years of my career. I was like, I was 28 before I did a Canadian television audition. So the theater is so much a part of how I judge myself, I think. Uh, I never wanted to be one of those guys that, that stopped doing it or lost touch with it. Um, and I've been really lucky with New York that it seemed every, every 11 years I, I go back and do, and do Broadway. The, the first one was 
was 2001, and it was uh, The Music Man. And uh, a revival of The Best Man, 11 years later, uh, Gore Vidal play. And then this last one was So Much Joy. I can't even tell you. It's a new play that feels very much like an old play. It feels like an old coward show. Uh, written by a, a young woman named Sandy Rustin. And this, it was just stylistically outrageous and hilarious, and audiences didn't know what to expect. And I, I had the most fun. And Sean just won a Tony yeah. on Broadway playing Oscar Levant. I saw it in Chicago. He was doing the, the opening was uh, at the Goodman Theater. Yeah, I saw it there too. Yeah, it was great. And he was so terrific. Uh, did the two of you compare notes about... We did because, uh, first of all, I um, weirdly, Deborah Messing was doing a show in New York at the same... Cause called, I think it was called Birthday Candles at the same time that Sean was just launching... Uh, his show, Goodnight Oscar, in, in Chicago. So I gave myself, a couple of years ago, I gave myself a little birthday trip. And I just flew in and surprised her, and I flew to Chicago and surprised him. But then when he finally got to Broadway, two months later, I was not only there at the same time, but we were on the same street. Our theaters were two blocks apart. We were both on 44th. And the number of people that would come to the stage door every night for a for an autograph or whatever and say, I we just saw Sean's show. He doesn't he doesn't come to the door. He doesn't sign. Thank you. I said, I know. He was so busy in that show. <laughs> and he played what, Rhapsody in Blue, was that it? Um, was, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's pretty stunning what he did in that show. There were pictures of him uh, soaking his arms after yeah. the after the performance cuz he uh, I think uh, not a lot of people know that he's a well, certified concert pianist. Oh, he's certified. <laughs> um, he's sort of fiable. Uh, I didn't know it either back in the day. It was not something he threw around. Um, you know, when we started the show, I was like 35. I think Megan was 37. We, we were, we'd been around. Sean was pretty young. He was 28 and um, just out of college. But what I didn't realize was he was out of college for conducting. Like he's, he's a tr and he's been playing forever. So he sat down. I might have been at Jimmy Burrow's house one night. We were having a, a dinner early on in the run and he sat down at the piano, and we all just our jaws just dropped. And he was, it was, he was talking at the same time. He was just kibitzing and playing Gershwin or Beethoven or something, bananas. So I, I hate him a lot. <laughs> He's very talented, yeah, and very funny, indeed. But so are you. Thank you. When you, you couldn't get Sean, that's what it is, right? No, 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 I, no, no, I was, no. I was, I was like, God damn it! All right. Oh, what's we'll the, get him. The other guy. What's the other guy's name? <laughs> if I could go back for a second to Will and Grace when you first started it. Um, being a gay man, I can relate to this. Uh, you were asked to play. It was a gay role, gay character, mm -hmm. Will Truman. Uh, did you have any reservations, do you recall, at the time about playing Will? Not about that part, no. He, uh, I had played at that point um, probably six gay roles. Four of them on television, two of them on, uh, uh, on stage. Um, it was... All I wanted to do was the Rocky Horror Show. I mean, I, I, this, none of that was scary to me. I think the only thing that was scary was that sort of uh, be careful what you wish for thing. Because I read that script and I knew. I knew it was the one. And that was scary. Because it's like... This now is, you have to prove it. Well, uh, not Back only yourself so, up. I didn't even... Because at that point, like I said, I was so ready. I'd been auditioning for sitcoms and I'd been around for several pilot seasons. I was so, in my mid-30s, ready for my show, whatever that was going to be. And I read this one and I went, oh my God, I think this is my part. But that means, you, because I, I, I so flitted about roles for years and years in the theater that this is the one that's going to be on my tombstone. So I, I better like it. And I, I loved it. I mean, the thing about it that, that scared me that I might be um, an icon in that or for that community is actually the greatest fringe benefit of, of it's a it's one of the great privileges of my life we're very loyal well you are you are but you didn't have to be that's the other thing too I, I think that scared me is it's a bigger deal now than it was then people didn't necessarily expect that a, a, a gay man would play have to have to play a gay man nor did we expect straight guys to play straight roles uh certainly not on broadway but the community did not have to be welcoming to the show or to me glad didn't have to be welcoming but they were so much. And well, it so, also tells you what a good job you did. I mean, well, I hope so. Uh, yeah. I can remember I was not when Will and Grace first went on the air. Uh, I was at home doing something in the kitchen, and uh, <laughs> I had the TV on, 
and I really wasn't watching, but I heard the humor and I, I stopped what I was mm. doing and sat down to watch it and it was just done so well. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the, th that was the flavor is that is, you know, if you're just listening to Friends or it versus Will and Grace, yeah, we were a gay show and, and, uh, and the writers were unapologetic about writing those two characters or three characters if you include Karen. Uh, <laughs> yes, if you include <laughs> Karen and, and Leslie, wonderful Leslie. Oh, and, yeah. How tragic about uh, his passing. Um, do you stay in touch with everybody from the show? Um, to a degree, uh, Sean and I now are talking all the time, which is great. I just, I just spoke to Deborah last week and tried to set her up with someone. Um, and, uh, and I haven't spoken to Megan in a while. Because I noticed when I, when I was going researching uh, and stuff, the, one of the questions they always ask people who are, you know, responding to um, the Internet, are, ask questions like, uh, are, are um, Eric and... Deborah, friends, do they talk, yeah. you know, and, and, and I've noticed it's the same about all the sitcoms. Are they still friends? Are they it's still so, friends? Are you're they... so right. And uh, like I, I've become close friends with Jason Alexander over the years. And so as a Seinfeld fan, that's one of the dopey questions that came out of my mouth the first time. Is like, you, do you and Jerry hang out? Because <laughs> I think that's the nature of television, but particularly of sitcom. When you watch people in one apartment week after week after week and they don't even knock. They just come into each other's apartment. You just want to know that that's real. Uh, and I think somebody else was saying the other day that people touch you more when you were on a sitcom because they think they, they, think they can, they, that they should, that you're their buddy. A number of people that grab me and say, my mom loves you. And I'm like, it's great, but, you know, can, can you let go? <laughs> that's very intimate. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I had an experience like that once. Yeah. Was, yeah, you're you're even more so. You're you. I was yeah talking well, to the camera to a degree. Yeah, <laughs> I was flirting with a waiter once, and he said, "My mom loves you." Yes, which is not what you want to hear. Well, it's, anyway, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Uh, what are you looking forward to doing next? What do you have on the docket? Um, I I'm doing a show. I did a show last year that I'm really proud of. I'm just a small part of called The Other Black Girl on Hulu, and you can watch it now. It is streaming, all 10 episodes are streaming. I think it's amazing, based on a, on a, a big novel from about three or four years ago. And the three young women that star in it, clearly I'm not the black girl or the other black girl, um, but the three young uh, women that star in it are so great. And I just want more people to see this show, and I, I really am hoping to do a second season, so. Hulu, if you're listening. <laughs> um, we shot in Atlanta. We had the greatest time. And it was a very... It, it, I didn't think it was that different a role for me because um, I've played a lot of bad guys. People don't necessarily see those those series. I've had, in the last few years, I've done a, a few. I did a show called Slasher a couple of years ago for, uh, for the Shutter Network. Were you the title character, Slasher? Uh, I, I, you'd think so. But in fact, I, I was the really... There was, there was someone, some mystery character of all these characters. It's a little uh, sort of Agatha Christie, but a lot more bloody. I was just playing the meanest asshole son of a bitch ever. It was so much fun. Um, but the guy I'm playing on The Other Black Girl is not that. He's, he's deceptively kind, but there's something dark there. And it's been really interesting for people to see the show and say, I didn't, like, I've never seen you do that before. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think so. I thought it was just kind of me being charming, but... Clearly, there's a darkness in my. In I don't my, believe that in, in my Canadian. soul. That's right. <laughs> everybody knows everybody from Canada is nice. We are nice, to your face. <laughs> okay. Do you think uh, being born and raised in Canada had any impact on you dealing with Hollywood and working in the business? Hundred percent. How? Um, I think just. I mean, just the, the joke you just said about Canadians are nice. It's sort of true, like, I don't know that many Canadians that didn't come down here with a different sort of set of uh, people skills. Uh, we, we weren't raised with the expectation that, uh, which is ironic because it's this vaguely socialist country, but we weren't raised with the expectation that we were going to win, that we were going to win all, all, all the marbles, and nobody told us we could be president. There's a sense of, of community and of earning your keep. I, I, 
Never expected if, that if that if I I always expected that I was going to make it in somehow, but I didn't think I was going to make it at 21 or 25. That I was going to apprentice through my 20s and become the actor I wanted to become and have uh, a confidence and with that a gratitude. I think, I think people say you're so nice. You say th- please and thank you and and you say how weird. Uh, but um, it it also it also comes with a sense of where you are in the world. You know, people from America say, hey, I'm American. And people from Canada go, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm Canadian. <laughs> they say it quieter and they apologize. So I think that helped to, to uh, that's why there's so many Canadians working here. We, we wean our way in slowly and politely. Did you ever have an idea of going to Hollywood, though? When you were, you know, you, you hear about uh, the British bands who felt they didn't right. make it until they made it in America. Did you, as an actor, early on, think about making it or coming to Hollywood? It's an interesting question for me because I, by the time I was sort of, I guess, 16. Well, no, no, by the time I was 16, my dreams were very theater and very local. I just wanted to make it at the Stratford Festival where I eventually uh, got an apprenticeship and I wanted to make it in Toronto theater. I, but I, when I thought back and realized my dreams as a 10-year-old were that I wanted to star on Get Smart. I want. I watched Mash and All in the Family with my dad, and I, I wanted that. When I realized that was a job that you could have, um, and I, all those years later, I had a really sweet moment on, at, at the, the Emmys. The one I won my my single Emmy. It was, I was staring at it and remembering that that's the exact award that that Don Adams won, lead actor in a comedy for Get Smart and. I guess 50 years earlier. Is that right? No, 30 years earlier. So um, so that, there was a, an ambition as a kid. The games I played, um, I, had a, I was not a sports kid. I was not a popular kid. I had very few friends. So the games I played in my backyard or in my room were very detailed. And I looked back one day and realized that I always ran the credits before my game. My game was not just a game, it was a television show. So somehow I was gearing myself up to be on people's idiot boxes. Idiot boxes. (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) We'll be back for more in a moment. What do you think is the best advice you ever gave someone? Don't wear that. You're not... How do I want to put this? You're not a, a young guy anymore. You're not a young kid. I was so prepared for a spit take. Oh, right sorry. Uh, I'll be 71 next month. Mm. And sometimes when I stop and I reflect on where I've been and what I've done, I think to myself, yeah, I think my best days are behind me. Do you ever have those kinds of ideas or thoughts? Sure. Um, I just turned 60, and uh, which was upsetting. <laughs> but also... I turned a corner where I realized on, on the last five shows I've worked on, not uh, in the theater or on television, I'm the oldest guy. I don't feel, you know, like Christopher Plummer or something, but I, but that's kind of the role I end up taking one way or the other. And uh, even on a show, I did a show for three years that I'm very proud of on, on Netflix called Travelers. And even then, that was so it's six, seven years ago, I was the oldest guy. And I was, and I kind of like that part. I was such an apprentice for so many years. I was mentored one way or the other by so many senior actors that to uh, to be the guy that is setting the tone, that is um, bringing his experience, uh, I kind of like a lot. Gravitas. A bit of gravitas. I never had gravitas before. <laughs> I, I rent it. Now. It's not full time. I just... What is, do you think, the best decision you ever made? Ooh, Wow. My father really wanted me to go to a university. They were, they were very supportive of what I did, but they also were that sort of classic, have a fallback position, maybe you could teach acting or whatever. I did not. I went to a, a theater school in Toronto, um, and that was, that was me at, at 18 going, no, I know what I'm doing. That was a big turning point for me. Um, and then the, just the, the, the travel, the, the, the decision to leave Toronto in 92, to and try my hand in Vancouver, which to an American audience probably sounds like, yeah, 
<laughs> North Dakota to South Dakota. It's like, no, no, no. There was a lot more television going on in Vancouver. It was a real decision to invest in myself. And that year, 92, I, I ended up doing just nonstop television stuff. A lot of it American that was shooting up there after 21 Jump Street. But then the decision a couple of years later to go south um, and stake my claim in L.A., uh, which took time. I mean, that, was, that would have been 93 that I did that, and I didn't get Will and Grace until 98. So I think this, the decisions to, that involve believing in myself um, professionally uh, that, that were risk-taking are, are the ones that clearly paid off. Well, what do you think the best piece of advice you ever got was? The problem with this question is that it's, it, the answer is so cliched, but it is so true for me. And it's those three words, uh, follow your dreams. And who did I get that advice from? I, I don't even remember. Probably a song or this or that. There's a song I sing now if, I, if I'm doing a, I have a bit of an act. And if I, I always close with the same song. It's called Dream of a Child by uh, Burton Cummings. And the dreams I had as a kid were so specific to me. I'd see things on television and maybe base a game on that, but whatever it was, they were just my dreams, and, and I just, it's, it's, I try to give my, my son that advice. It's not easy to say these days. Following your dreams doesn't necessarily, you can't monetize that necessarily. It's a tougher world, I think. But in my case, that's, it's nothing more profound than that. If I hadn't, I would be very unhappy. I know I would. Where is this show you do every once in a while? Um, if I wanted to yes, see it. Yes, well, it's uh, sometime I, I've, I've, my favorite friendships in my life, and I have a lot of them, um, is uh, a man named Lauren Gold, who right now uh, is the keyboard player for The Who and Chicago. And he goes back and forth between them. And we have, we sometimes just get together at, at a small club, like Vitello's used to be up the street or whatever, and we just do an evening of, a lot of Billy Joel and Elton John, and, and uh, some, I, like, I like obscure stuff too. But he and I put together a show that we've done only in a few cities, um, which is very much based on the kid I was, not <clears throat> before 12, but in my teens. And it's called The Concert I, ne the Concert I Never Gave, except for like 2,000 times in my bedroom. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's me talking about the, the, this imaginative kid that knew he was gonna be an actor, but, but, but for my teens, I just wanted to be a rock star. And that's all I did in my bedroom. But I really did it. I, I dressed up like Freddie Mercury and Alice Cooper. And I performed all of the Kansas live album. And I was just, I was so lost in my rock dreams. And you'd think that maybe then I would have actually learned an instrument or started a band. Nope. It was just completely imaginary. So this, this show I do occasionally for, always for, for charity. But, uh is just sort of a description of this, again, the dream stuff. It's like you, I dreamed about, you know, being Elton John, and, that, and now I, I know him, you know, and I have Elton, uh, Elton John stories, and I, um, I know Alice Cooper, and all, the, all, these, all these... All these rock stars you're naming are very uh, theatrical. Very theatrical, 100%. And, uh, and so that that concept of the dream of a child becomes the the story of a man. If you know, if you just follow if it, you follow it. And if you're lucky, I mean, the luck of Will and Grace was the number of the outrageous number of guest stars we had, which allowed me to meet some of my heroes: um, Sidney Pollack and Gene Wilder and Madonna, Cher. And, <laughs> my heroes. We have different heroes, yes. <laughs> Though I loved Cher oh, when I was like nine. I was nine. I think of the women on television. It was Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched, Cher, um, and then oh, this is an obscure one, but from the original Planet of the Apes it was an actress named Lisa Hamilton. I think her name was, and she was Nova, the the the, the mute woman that uh, that Charlton Heston runs with into the uh, Forbidden Zone. And that was like, that was pre Farrah Fawcett, you know, on the wall. That was like, I was... Did you have Farrah Fawcett on your wall? Oh, of course oh. I did. And Linda Carter and Cheryl Ladd. And well, good for you. Sure. 
You're all American. You're not Canadian. <laughs> well, there was not a lot of. I couldn't have Anne Murray on my wall. It was just. It was just <laughs> no, less, not quite uh, the same. Less hot. Different league. Different league. Uh, let me see. Wait. Wait. What has been the scariest thing to happen to you in the public eye? <sighs> Do you like living in the public eye? Are you? You're still in, but you're so well known to to fandom. I, I the honest truth is, I like my particular whatever grade that is, you know, from, uh, of of fame. It's just right. Like I go to the I go to Vons every day and shop. I mean, I I, I my f level of fame has never got in my way. It almost always is just something happy, you know. If, if somebody recognizes me it's because they love that show it's not because they're angry at me for something so it's you know it's it's just a nice it's, it's a gentle uh, gentle level um i think i this is so obscure that no one would would care but i i was doing a show uh for tnt called perception uh about 10 years ago and i I was asked to sing. My Burton Cummings, who I mentioned before, is one of my heroes. He was the lead singer of the Guess Who and huge solo uh, career in Canada. And I was asked to sing at his being inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame. And I was shooting the show here in town. It's like no way I could make it happen. But I was so determined that I flew a red eye between uh, whatever it was after shooting all day. Got up the next day. Worked out this medley with his band. It was all supposed to be a surprise for him. But the combination of being exhausted and flying and not eating and having a Red Bull, I don't know what happened, but I got out on stage that night. It was being televised. And I don't know what came out of me, but it was, it was terrible. It was terrible for the first 15 notes. And I'm staring at Burton Cummings, who's in the audience, kind of not 100% sure why that guy from television is singing his songs. And why is he singing it so badly? Be, I, I have to say that's the thing that haunts me the most in the public eye. I'm sure it was in your head and not in, in reality. No, the first eight, eight to ten notes were really bad. How about Katie Lang? She's a famous Canadian who, who uh, is very talented and who we don't see enough of anymore. I agreed. Um, I know Katie a little bit from, from the old days. That's, uh, she it was a, a fundraiser in, in Hollywood one night that I think it was for the Elton John AIDS Foundation because Elton was there, and she was going to do five or six songs in the backyard, maybe not even that many. Uh, she performs in her bare feet by the pool, and she did uh, the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah, Hallelujah which right. she killed. And then Elton came out and sat down, and they did Sorry Seems to Be the Hardest Word with him playing. Yeah, Katie's pretty, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. What a voice. What do you think is the best advice you ever gave someone? Um, don't wear that. <laughs> I, I say that one a lot. Not to you, Steve. You know, right. uh, again, it's it's kind of the same thing. Like I, I, I think I should take it away from this the, the, the cliche of follow your dreams. It's more the advice I tend to give now, as I say, is from a point of view of an older guy. Um, and some of the younger casts I worked with, particularly Travelers, I, I, I was so impressed with all of these people. They're all in their 20s and all so good, but they, uh, a couple of them didn't really have a kind of um, working routine yet, you know, and I just, I, I think I, there was one of them I just sort of took aside and said, you're going to get so much more out of this. If you, are f if you are fully off book, if you make every take count, because it's a show that we didn't have all the money in the world, so it's like come in and hit the ground running. I think is I, I've never understood. I come coming from the theater. There's a work ethic and there's a, an expectation of your co-stars, uh, of anyone you're in, a, in the company with, that you're all going to come up to the same level, <clears throat> and that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, at least not all the time in television. And film. There's somebody who's been taught something else that they can. They'll find it. They'll find it, and it might take might take me 20 takes, or it might this or that. Um, <laughs> there was a, we had a guest star, uh, Sean and I did on um, on the podcast just yesterday. A wonderful actor named Marcus Flanagan, 
who had played my therapist in, in the second season of Will and Grace for one episode, and he falls for Grace. And, but he was telling a story on, that, uh, that when we started the week, he and I had this one scene that was about six pages at the, at the table, and then the next day they'd cut a page, and then event, but eventually by, the, by show night it was cut down to about two pages. That's television, but uh, we did it, didn't get a lot of laughs. They cut the guts out of it, so after the first take, uh, the writers said, we're going to go back to Tuesdays. That's uh, the five-page one. You, you got it? No. No, I don't got it. What are you talking about? No, I haven't memorized those lines. What are you talking about? They said, well, it's right here. Just have a quick look. He said, I'm not going to, I cannot do three new pages just like right now. That's, that's asking a lot. And they said, well, we have to do it this way. He said, well, I'll be calling for lines. They said, okay. And he said, well, what about Eric? And they said, oh, he's fine. Because <laughs> I just, I just, when it comes to memorizing lines, being your scene partner, uh, having thought it through, being there for you, uh, you, you can rely on me. It's, it's, I just think it's a, I think there's a, it's not just professionalism, it is a dedication to the nuts and bolts of this thing. If all you're dedicated to because some teacher told you that all that really matters is your character and you'll find it and it's a, it's a wank. I remember going to Will and Grace, a taping of Will and Grace uh, one time in particular, where they were changing a number of the lines after the, you know, yeah. after the first one seemed to work just fine. And you, everybody in the cast yeah. would just go with the flow. And, and they would be hysterical, you know. Yeah. The, the audience would be laughing and it was great fun. Hey, that's a real combination of, of, of a writing team that was never satisfied, never rested on their laurels. Uh, and a director that, that just, that, push for something better all the time um that it's like that's not funny enough something else um but with, when you have a live audience and they hear what we've been rehearsing for the last few days and then they hear that a joke was just written i think they're they go but if it's if it's really funny they go bananas because they can't believe that that, that they're seeing something that fresh would you want to do another series uh, another sitcom? Another I mean, sitcom. Yeah, I would. I would love. I, I would love to do series for years. I love. I love doing a, a drama series out of town. I love doing a sitcom here in town. The, the problem right now with the sitcom is just that it's um, it's a little, it's a little uh, outre at the moment. It, I, 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 nobody knows how to go back to what that is. And it's weird because young audiences dis discovered Friends, you know, and they. Uh, obviously discovered the office or whatever there's there's a there's a world where it could be reinvented i just i don't personally know how to do it right now i think i think the key to it i just i'm just making this up as i say it but it really got to me always got to me continues to when people uh like i say they don't know that there was a studio audience there when it's just they think it's canned laughter which is such an ancient thing from you know the, the, the 60s this and idea. you can hear it yeah and, and you can hear you know when it's fake but I think people got used to thinking that they're all fake, and I think that's why, as a style, it doesn't resonate as much anymore. But maybe there's a way to do a sitcom live and make sure the the audience is almost part of it, even if it's just a, even if you just sense them there that you sent. Because whenever people see outtakes or see behind the scenes things for Will and Grace, they it's so much fun because that's that's how loose and, and silly we were. When you're sitting at home, what do you watch? What do I watch? These days. These days. What have I loved? Uh, I loved The Great on Hulu. Um, there's so much to choose there's from There's so much now. to choose from. I, um, I've, I'm one of those people these days where I'm just constantly scolded by my friends that you haven't seen. You, tell me you've seen. Because I just, I can't, I can't keep up. And I, I have forget. a friend who just said, you haven't seen Murders in the Building? Right. No, I haven't. Sorry. <laughs> there's so many things to watch yeah. that... And then you have first-run movies and all this other stuff. Yeah. The dividing attention. There's, there's two things, particularly when you run into somebody here in town that you know that's in a show. And it's always the, what's worse, to tell them I haven't seen that show yet <laughs> or to tell them, well, I saw the first season. I don't know, maybe that rings worse. <laughs> like, And I just... Mm, Didn't stick with not it. For Sorry. Me. Not for me. Uh, do you remember what was your lowest point in your career? Um, this uh, honestly I, I think it would have been 2015 
not that long ago. Um, and it wasn't the po it wasn't the point in my career. It was my, where I was. Um, I was I just finished Perception. There was no fourth season forthcoming, so uh, I really wanted to be back in a series. I'm always happy, and and it was just it was sort of that period at the end of fourteen into fifteen, and it wasn't like I couldn't get work. In fact, there was two. I had to almost choose between two. Um, the jobs at, at the top of 15, but I just, I didn't feel, one, one was a sitcom actually that Sean was producing that just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like it, right to go back to that. And the other was a drama on Fox that I ended up doing the pilot, but, so it doesn't sound like the worst part of my career, right? But it, it was in some way because I didn't, I just didn't know who I wanted to be. I didn't, the same fears I was talking about before about Will, about going, oh my God, I might end up doing this for years hit me again and I got very, I got a, a real panic attacks of, of just, is this, um, is this the next crucial choice? Turns out, no, because it's a pilot that didn't get picked up and that, that's the end of that. And that's, yeah. But I, I so enjoyed Travelers, which came the second, I mean, the next year that it was just, it was just, a, it was a low point because you start to wonder if, if there is another round for you. Uh, I don't need the things I do to be uh, the most popular show on television. I, I, I really just, I love the act of making a series with a new group of people. And if, it, if, if the writing is, is good, like Slasher, for instance, I, I just had so much fun playing that character. And I knew it's not, it's a gore fest, really. I didn't, I knew most of America probably wouldn't see it, but, but you can. It's on Shudder right now. <laughs> um, season five. Uh, but that's the one that comes to mind, I think, because my, co my confidence was at its lowest. Don't you think, though, that every actor has a certain amount of insecurity that goes with the job, goes with the territory? I absolutely. Because do. it's so dependent on other people's opinions? Yeah. No, I, I, um, I, th I, I can only judge myself, but I've always been a, a heady combination of security and insecurity. <laughs> You know, I've had, I have tremendous belief in self since I was very young. And at the same time, there isn't any taping of Will and Grace or any, any stage performance that I'm not a real, you know, nervous wreck before because the idea of failure looms large <laughs> always. And, and just the, the, the insecurity of the business too, just the, uh, the, of the, of getting an actual job, whether, you know, I... It was never enough just to get a job. I always wanted it to be something that I loved and that I looked forward to, and I've been really lucky in that. How did you feel about auditions? I didn't, I liked auditions. Oh, really? Yeah, I did. And uh, since, and I can never quite figure out what that was, but since then, other people have expressed it better. Brian Cranston had a, had a great quote where he talked about, and Michael Keaton, too, which talked about realizing as a young man that, that that's your job that day. It's not about getting the job. The job is to be great in that room. And, and once I realized that, and that it wasn't about waiting around, waiting around, that, that all, the best I could do was just kill in that room and then let go, forget it, and know that, that they're, they're going to go with the other guy because he's taller or he's this or he's that. It's the stuff that's out of my control. You know, I interviewed Brian Cranston once, long before he, he was on, what was it, Malcolm in the Middle or whatever, mm -hmm. sh wh whatever show that was. I'm sorry, Brian, if you're watching. Um, he used to work, I was doing a series for CBS on dating, long before the internet, and long hmm. before there were dating sites. He used to work for an agency on the west side here in Los Angeles where he would interview people who were, would come in and talk about themselves, and then those tapes would be shown oh, to sure. yeah, respective yeah. dates. Right. And uh, he used to be the guy who would, who would do those interviews. Uh, and then I encountered yeah. him later in his uh, headier days as an actor. Uh, and it was just so funny, the things that people do. You worked for Baskin Robbins, didn't you? That was my first job, yeah. Uh, I had a lot of, I mean, I think I had eight or nine jobs in Canada before I... Uh, before the theater really started, uh, men, uh, two different men's stores, and but Baskin Robbins was a big one because I made manager very quickly. <laughs> I said a lot of trust. What's your favorite ice cream? Okay. <laughs> favorite flavor? You didn't think it would. I didn't think we get this serious, Steve. Rocky Road. Uh, I'm gonna go pralines and cream. Pralines and cream. Mm -hmm. 
which was back then kind of an old person's flavor, but <laughs> now, now, it, I could, now it makes sense. Now it fits right now in. Now it huh? fits right in. Can you finish this sentence? My life would have been better had I... Ooh, my life would have been better. Hmm. It's so tough. It's pretty good right now, isn't it? It's pretty, it's pretty good right now. And I think I, I, there are certain opportunities that I didn't take, perhaps. But if I had, then maybe I wouldn't have met my wife or then had my son. And you know what I mean? There's, uh, so I, I don't have, I have regrets about perhaps uh, things I could have done better. But uh, that's just, you know, that, that's just self flagellation um i think i always the, the, the ex expectations i had of the business and of myself in it and and of you know fame were pretty moderate i think i've i think i'm ha i'm happy at the uh at this you level. seem pretty normal i seem pretty normal <laughs> that's the canadian part huh? <laughs> that's the canadian part yeah i think that that's always been a real mix i you know i married a Canadian girl and and uh, though she was in the business we've lived a very really well, to use your word normal life and there was a lot of uh, a lot of that I liked I wanted that I, I don't know how well I would have done running around uh, Hollywood as a single man I like to tell people maybe I said this to you Hollywood was good to me but not good for me ah yeah I mean it's there's a lot of truth to that, but uh, I, I think I think the one thing I wonder about sometimes, because when I talk about, say, getting Will and Grace, that I was 35, and then you know all the kids, because they were kids, on Friends were all in like you know, with the exception of maybe Lisa, they were all like 22, 23. They were just starting out, and and so many of the shows that followed that were young people. And I often thought, should I have come down here earlier? Or, but then it's like, well, if I had. And I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been ready. I wouldn't have been ready for for when Will came along. Does Hollywood seem too uh, youth oriented now? Well, I mean, it's it would be it would sound curmudgeonly to say that that was the case. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, my mother used to say, I, "I would." There's not enough movies for us, uh, you know. She said, "There's this one movie. I think that looks good. That looks like it's very much about you know older people." I said, "Well, are you going to go see it?" Well. I think eventually it's like well, see, <laughs> kids go to opening weekends, mom. If you're gonna if you're gonna wait till you know two dollar Tuesday in a month, that's why they don't make movies for you. And um, so I, I understand the youth of it all, but everyone's youth, right? It could be a movie about forty two year olds, and I'm like, Jesus, they're eighteen years younger than me. God damn it, Steve, we're old. Ooh, did anybody ever? I'm curious. Did anybody mm. ever tell you? when you first took Will and Grace not to do it because it was a gay character? No. No. I, I don't think uh, that came up at all. Um, Can you see where the show had an impact on how gay people are perceived today? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and yet we always maintain, because it's true, that we didn't have that in mind. You know, it's a sitcom. Um, but then I remember in, it, was, it was in 2012 when we hadn't, I hadn't spoken to Max Muchnick uh, or the cast in a couple, a while. But all of a sudden he was calling around going, did you see? And he'd you know, said that out of the blue, he just said, Will and Grace had done, done, had done more for marriage equality or whatever. It's like, wow. But I don't think I'd ever really thought that hard about the effect. It's, it's when people come up, young people, and say, you made it easier, and that's my favorite thing. You did make it easier. Now it's it's nothing. I mean, Andy Cohen and Anderson Cooper on New Year's Eve, they can be just as yeah, sure. gay uh, as uh, they uh, want to be. Well, the, the most important thing is young people, young people not having to go through years and years of hiding and shame. Um, we, we did a th It was Ben Platt came on the, the reboot of Full and Grace playing a young... You know, so very entitled you know, gay man because he'd had his his parents had both wanted to throw a, they were divorced but they each wanted to throw a coming out party for him and stuff like that because it's 
if if it's not true for everyone, and certainly not for the trans community, but it's it's gotten easier in general, I think. And uh, and if we had something to do with that, I love that. Oh, you did. I can speak from experience. Yes, you did. No, that's good. Thank you. I want to come meet Steve Komet for myself. <laughs> I laughed over that. Yeah. Clever use of the name, too. Yeah. So. Thanks. Thank Eric, you. I appreciate it. C thank you. <laughs> you're you're co welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein.